uh, uh, bright beads and the current density gets to the point where the um, the current pinches off and so you have these bright beads called bead lightning. Mm. So if you like, stars are a form of bead lightning and they can be formed in the laboratory in groups. Um, that's what they find. So, mm. And also they're set spinning by the discharge. So all of the conundrums about where does the sun's angular momentum come from and why is the solar system angular momentum is so out of kilter with that of the sun. Well, most of the sun's planets were not born by, with the sun. They've been captured since. And, um, and the stars nearby have axial inclinations which are similar to the sun's, which is what you'd expect if they're all born in the same galactic lightning bolt. That's that's uh, so fascinating to me, and I mean, in that sense, we don't even have to go, you know, way outside our own solar system to find the fascinating aspects. Again, if we look at Saturn and, and talk about that for a mm. while, we have the this weird hexagonal uh, glow taking place on Saturn at the uh, yes. at the, uh, the at the poles. We have the rings of Saturns as well. Are these all? Remnants of the, of w from the time when this was a, a what you call proto Saturn or, or a minor yes. sun is, is that what's going yes. on? Yes. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the puzzles about the Earth is where did it get all of its water? And the yeah. answer is it got it from its parent Saturn, and Saturn's rings are, are water, water ice, <clears throat> and uh, the rings cannot have been there all that long. Uh, astronomers point out that they are ephemeral, that is, they can't have been there since the beginning of uh, the solar system according to standard thinking. No, the rings are expulsion rings. Astronomers are always talking about accretion rings around objects, but uh, they never consider the possibility that they are expulsion rings. But uh, electrical bodies can expel material in an attempt to achieve stability. And uh, in doing so, they create rings and meteors and moons and comets, all of the debris that we see. The the water aspect that you mentioned there, that's that's if you want to look at it from that point of view, that's Sumerian mythology. That's the Enuma Elish right there in one way, if you heard of that. Yes, we have to be very careful about mythology, though, because uh, when they described the plasma phenomena in space, it looked to them like shimmering water at times. And uh, so the descriptions of the waters above the Earth and beneath the Earth the very term the Earth wasn't, it didn't mean the, the Earth we're standing on, it didn't mean our planet, it meant the thing that was being created in the sky. So the waters above the Earth and, and uh, beneath the Earth re, were referring to things seen in the heavens. Hmm. And this is, uh, this takes a, you know, paints a completely different picture of a lot of myths and legends, which at present we misinterpret. And it's understandable when you consider that what was being seen in the ancient sky is something never witnessed by modern man. It's it's so it's incredibly fascinating to me. I, I'm, I'm thinking also about uh, well, we have Mars. That's another subject in itself. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. with Valles Marineris, weird uh, scars across the planetary surface, but also. Um, if if we talk a little bit more about the mythological aspect and, and in terms of. Uh, um, you know when that when the when the what you talked about before the life was formed somewhere else when you say that mm. do do you mean that or do you expect that we might have seen life on on mars venus and earth at that point and we might have some kind of minor panspermia thing going on that life from these planet came to earth <laughs> or, or are you talking about sentient life human beings at that point living on these planets as well how far do you go there well, um, <clears throat> when you change the, uh, the whole paradigm that you're operating from, all sorts of other things um, uh, fall into place. For one thing, Venus uh, is a new planet. That's why it's so, so hot and why its atmosphere is so dense. Uh, it was born from Saturn in the process of it achieving electrical stability on entering the sun's uh, environment. As I said before, one of the ways of achieving stability of an electric object is to um, uh, disgorge part of its charged core into space to create a subsidiary object, and uh, Venus is such an object. Uh, we can tell that uh, Mars and um, the Earth were partnered with Saturn because our each uh, spinning planet acts like a giant gyroscope which means that the uh, axis tends to point to the same place in space, in inertial space. 
and uh, the axial tilts of Saturn, Mars and the Earth are within a degree or, or so of each other. So this is one way of trying to identify family members, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, the Moon and Mercury, um, they have uh, similarities which suggest that they were uh, from the same parent. Uh, the Moon was captured by the Earth. Uh, electrical capture is quite simple. Uh, is when you exchange charge, you uh, vary the uh, effective gravitational mass of an object and that operates to uh, capture and steady and circularize the orbit quite quickly. That's a missing mechanism that uh, doesn't allow astronomers to uh, postulate um, uh, capture as a very likely mechanism. But in an electric universe, it is the mechanism for uh, capturing bodies. So... Uh, would you say that that's the same thing that is happening on a molecular level as well? When you have this interchanging of, uh, is it protons or electrons that they it, they um, they they capture each other, right? Or, or am I wrong on that? Uh, that's um, that's different, I would say, because uh, what we're dealing with here is large, extended, massive objects, uh, which and it's the um, the change in gravitational mass. That is heresy too, uh, until you've discarded Einstein's idea of gravity. Mm -hmm. um, but the electrical nature of mass is embodied in the structure of protons, electrons and neutrons. And in an extended body, they form tiny electric dipoles. And uh, gravity is always an attractive force in the same way that if you have a whole lot of magnets on a slippery uh, surface, they will all uh, tend to uh, come together and line up in the same direction. Mm. In other words, the force is always attractive. Uh, it's quite simple, you know, but this yes. has been one of the big puzzles about gravity. Why is it always attractive? Well, it's because they're rotating electric dipoles, which all line up in the same direction. And they're all subatomic, and that's why the uh, gravitational force is 40, up to 40 orders of magnitude weaker than the naked electric force. It's because the distortion of an electron or a proton or a neutron is so minute that the uh, electric force, the dipole force, is reduced to uh, 40 orders of magnitude over the naked electric force. So uh, it, it, it's a simple picture, but it does show that uh, Newton's law of gravity is correct. However, the so-called gravitational constant is not constant at all. It's an electrical variable. So if you uh, transfer charge from one body to another with a cosmic thunderbolt, then the um, apparent, the gravity between them will change and the bodies will tend to move apart or move in a, a way which will prevent collision. Hmm. That's we, why I say cometary collisions with the Earth are fanciful and not and the uh, pictures that you see in the magazines of a comet smashing into the Earth are entirely fanciful because there's not a single thunderbolt in sight. Huh. So th there's other bodies that in our solar system also that, that capture these. We can see the incredible craters not only on the moon, obviously, but we saw yes. uh, back in, um, was it 95, the Schumacher levy impact on, on Jupiter, right? That's right, yes. It didn't actually impact Jupiter. The lightning bolts from Jupiter destroyed the incoming objects and created those uh, characteristic uh, plasma gun uh, discharge scars, which are those circular rings. Huh. Um, they are not uh, fallout from a, um, an explosion in the atmosphere. And that's why there was so little water seen in the... Um, uh, they expected to see water from the comet. Mm -hmm. Well, comets are not... Uh, some comets have some water, but not much. Uh, the water is actually generated uh, by a combination of hydrogen or protons from the sun and um, oxygen atoms stripped electrically from the uh, comet. In the case of Jupiter, the discharges from Jupiter's ionosphere... Uh, which allowed one of the cometary pieces to be seen beyond the horizon where it was unexpected. Um, it's because it happened in the ionosphere. The object is destroyed by the uh, uh, bolt from the planet, and the bolt comes from the regions both from the ionosphere and the upper atmosphere below the ionosphere, and a lightning bolt shoots a jet of material into the upwards into the stratosphere or the ionosphere mm -hmm. and it comes down electrically in a ring just like a um, uh, a mass uh, what are they call them? those mass spectrometers you know where you oh. uh, send a charged particle through a magnet